So it was time for me to develop an, an identity of my own. You know, I've been daughter, wife, mother, grandmother, everything for everybody else. But this business, if I could make it a business, was mine. And are you someone who has been thinking about starting a jewelry business in retirement? Or you maybe have been making jewelry for many years and you haven't gotten really serious about selling your jewelry to some of your dream customers. Well, if that's you and you're interested in learning more about how you can make traction, maybe in your 60s, 70s and beyond, you're gonna love this interview with Estelle Vernon. Hey there, I'm Tracy Matthews. I'm the Chief Visionary Officer of Flourish and Thrive Academy and the host of the Thrive by Design podcast. And I help jewelry business owners and hobbyists launch, grow and scale successful five, six and seven figure jewelry businesses using my methodology called the desired brand effect. And the desired brand effect is the core of all of our programs, including the laying the foundation program, which you're gonna hear a little bit more about today. Now, before I dive in, I'm gonna introduce Estelle in a minute. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe, you hit that little subscribe button right now. And if you wanna be notified when we release new videos, please hit that little notification bell. All right. Estelle Vernon is a longtime member of the Flourish and Thrive community. She is also a woman, a total badass in her 70s, who is crushing it with her jewelry business and building a business that is aligned with what matters most to her. Taking a lot of time off, spending only a little bit of time working on the business, but also fully expressing her creative flow. She exhibits her art at the Torpedo Factory in Alexandria, Virginia, and she's going to share a little bit more about her story in depth in this episode. Let's dive in. I am so excited to have Estelle Vernon on the show. She is a longtime Flourish and Thrive Academy member. Gosh, she's probably been in our community six or seven years at this point. And I'm thrilled because Estelle pitched me for a podcast episode. And I was like, oh my gosh, Estelle, why have I not had you on yet? So welcome to the show, Estelle. Well, thank you for having me. And actually, in August, it was seven years. So this coming August will wow. be eight years. That's amazing. So it's an honor to have you here. So Estelle, you. you know, oh, I'm going to say this like in a kind way. She's one of the people who came to us as someone kind of in a retirement, building a retirement business and doing a second career after her first career was over. And she's been just a huge figure in our community for a very long time. We had an amazing pre-interview and I hope some of those things come up. Now, before we dive in, Estelle, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you came to designing jewelry and kind of where you are now? Okay, uh, well, thank you, Tracy. I actually started making jewelry in high school. I was one of the lucky ones who went to a school that uh, had art medals as an elective. Oh, cool. it, was, it was my senior year. It was the very last elective I could have. I was on a totally academic program. I took it. I liked it, but sort of shelved that for a while. Mm -hmm. Went to college that had an art school. They did not allow me to take any classes, couldn't take any jewelry classes. So I went on to become a clinical audiologist and worked at the uh, National Institutes of Health. Wow. And uh, in, so you, help, you help people with hearing. I did the diagnostic hearing testing. Wow. So you started as a clinical audiologist. Clinical, yes, at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, I loved my patients. I loved everything about that. What I didn't like was the administration. And uh, my problem was I had my third child without permission from my boss. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a terrible thing to do. I'm very glad I didn't listen <laughs> because he's turning 40 in May and oh, uh, wow. was, was a tremendous gift to us. So oh, your son, I your mean, child is turning, he's turning 40. I thought you meant your boss is, is turning 40. I'm no, like, no. I, I'm doing the math. I'm my, like, boss, I, my boss is deceased. My boss is deceased, which is why I can say this. Yeah. I walked out of NI, I left NIH January 1st of 1987. And three weeks later, I was registered at Montgomery College uh, taking metals classes. That's amazing. So I actually start, essentially started this business in whatever way you want to call it a business, hobby business, business. I was always looking at it as a business. 
you would probably have looked at it as a hobby business. But I started I think you have in a business as well. I started in 1987 and my baby was three years old wow. and I continued to take classes. I'm someone who believes in lifetime learning. It's one of the core values of my business to always be taking classes and to try to you know learn as much as I can. And it wasn't until I was always taking classes. I was making things. I was selling a little bit, but not at the same level that I am, you know, thinking about it today. And mostly I was the perfectionist who had to, you know, everything had to be perfect. So you made one or two things a year. That was never oh, going to wow. So you come from that art jewelry <laughs> kind of background. Then. Oh, yeah. yes. I was a little too perfect. Although my work is extremely well crafted. It's and beautiful. That is something, thank you. So that's something that I do include in, you asked me what, you know, eventually you'll ask me what my, what I believe my dream client is. And I believe those clients value that type of craftsmanship. Well, let's talk about your craftsmanship and also the design style of your work or your signature style, because you're someone, you know, you come kind of more from the art jewelry world. I've known you for a long time. So I've seen your work evolve <laughs> and I know that you do kombu and that you have a strong, you know, collection in pearls and a bunch of other things. So why don't you talk a little bit about the inspiration behind your collection? Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. Um, I have been doing a lot with textures. I'm a big texture person. Maybe that comes from always being a tactile type of yes. person. And I learned, I, one of the classes I took years ago was an etch a etching class where we were doing a toner transfer and the instructor had said bring in a photograph and we're going to make a texture plate i'm going to show you how to make a texture plate and i had taken a photo of a wormy log that i had i had taken the photograph in yellowstone national park and it was an absolutely magnificent log just the worms did a great job you yeah. know i'm sorry for the tree <laughs> Uh, it was killed by pine bark beetle, but man, it has opened up an entire world for me. So I started doing a toner transfer with that and uh, creating some pieces that are fabricated using sterling silver with the 24 karat gold. And then I oxidized the pieces. This is like the piece I'm wearing mm -hmm. here. So the silver is black, the gold absolutely pops. Mm -hmm. And you can also see the texture quite a bit from that. So that's one of the things I've been doing. The other imagery that I've been doing a lot lately is Japanese textiles. And I'm using the same type of black and white photos of Japanese katagame, which are stencils used to silkscreen fabrics. So that gives, those are the ways that I've been getting the textures. I've been using hydraulic dye forming, which means that instead of me hammering the mm -hmm. puff, I get to use a 20 ton hydraulic yes. press and let it do all the work yep. for me. But the rest of it is all completely hand fabricated. And, um, you know, it's all me. I'm the elf in the studio. Yeah, I love it. It's so great. Well, let's uh, talk about your dream client a little bit because you have a high attention to detail. You are, there is a little bit of a, in a way, a perfectionist quality, which is amazing, you know, when it comes to buying like yes. a high value piece of jewelry. So let's talk about that? Like, who are your dream customers? I see most of them are mature people. I'm not even going to say women anymore because I find a lot of men okay. who come in and buy for the women who are someone who really loves elegant simplicity. And mm -hmm. I think that's always been my design mantra. It's, I learned it from my mother. Yes. So I think she had just this beautiful, elegant simplicity about her. And um, I think osmosis, I just picked up a lot of those things uh, from her. So, and it's also what I like, not tits and glitz. Uh, <laughs> so I think that uh, you got that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, so funny. <laughs> not, not to say that I don't like my gemstones, but I might like one or two in a piece and not, you know, a lot of them. You're not like a pave. So I think my place. people... <laughs> No, a lot of, I like a lot of uh, flesh sets. I also don't mind large stones yeah. in an appropriate uh, use. Exactly. So I think that I attract people who like the same type of thing that I do. They like the elegant simplicity. 
whether it's my pearl jewelry, which is a minimalist line using sterling silver bars and high quality Chinese freshwaters, pinks and whites, uh, Tahitian pearls. Lately, Akoya's Japanese pearls are mostly on a, a commission basis mm -hmm. because they've gotten too expensive to use them in the studio as, uh, you know, just as a speculative type of thing. Mm -hmm. But I love pearls. I love high luster. I love good color, natural colors. I will not use a dyed pearl unless someone asks me. And then I will really try to convince them something else. Yes, exactly. So those are the kinds of things I think that the people that uh, I sell to also value that craftsmanship. Yes. You know, because do. I've been at shows. There are other people who are selling pearl jewelry, but why would they pick mine over someone else's? Because it looks higher expensive. end. It looks yeah. like what it is. Yeah. It looks expensive. It looks. Yeah. And so, you know, we were in New York. When was that? Maybe 2019. And you came to one of our SOS retreats at the time before we called the program Momentum. Mm -hmm. And we were right. doing a video shooting day. So I know a lot about your history and your background <laughs> and you're a breast cancer survivor. So let's talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Like how did, you know, having this jewelry business help you get through that? And how are you doing today? And all the things I'd love to know. Thank you for bringing that up. I think the breast cancer is what kicked me in the pants to really kick the business up. Mm. I was actually diagnosed in 1996. It was a rough, you know, year, year and a half of treatment. I was one of those people that they first said, eh, it's probably not breast cancer. Eh, it's probably not anything. You've got 12 positive lymph nodes. So I actually went on a clinical trial at Duke Cancer Institute, and that will come around. I will bring that, weave that one back in with a promotion that I do every year in October. So I think the, the breast cancer, it was really a now or never. If you're okay. going to kick this business up, right now is the time to do it. I started, I had no idea how one juried into anything. A couple of the people who were at the torpedo factory had suggested, they kept saying, well, are you juried in? I'm like, what's juried in? Yeah. So I started the process of putting together, you know, having photographs done, putting things in, applying. It actually took me three times before I juried in. And that was mostly because I didn't quite know what they wanted and nobody would tell you. Which oh, I, yeah. That's, it's so, it's not so gonna, crazy. So I did jury in in 2001 and then joined my studio in 2002. So um, that was the, you had a jury into the torpedo factory to get absolutely space there. It's, so, it's highly, it's highly juried. Yes. So tell us a little bit about the torpedo factory. What is it? Where is it? Okay. It <laughs> is all the things. A, it is, an, it is a former torpedo factory opened. It's actually a hundred year old building. It was wow. opened uh, on the waterfront in Alexandria, Virginia in 1918 the day after Armistice Day. So they ended World War I and the US government opened this torpedo factory to start producing torpedoes for the next world war. In 1974, a group of artists got together. The building had been used for government records, mm. uh, pigeons, pigeon poop. <laughs> Uh, for a long time. And um, they pitched the city of Alexandria about turning that into an artist center. So in 2024, we will be celebrating 50 years of being an art center. So it is a juried facility. There are about 82 working studios, over 100 and probably 150 artists and about seven galleries within the building. I share a studio with two other jewelers, one of them being one of the original people who started the Torpedo Factory. And as I said, I've been on the, the lease there since 2002. And so we're open to the public seven days a week. Are you so there seven days a week, Estelle? No, God, no. Two to three days a week, depending on what our schedule is. So do you guys um, rotate out like the yes. artists who man the booths and stuff like that? So not everyone. Yeah, we, we set we set up our schedule so that our studio maintains the seven days. I have one person that comes in. She wants to work 
that extra day. So she's there okay. for three days a week. And then Gretchen and I work two days a week. Some week, like the week of boot camp, I have written myself out. I will be working Sunday. I've written myself out. So next week I will be working three days. So I'll cover three days in order to give myself that extra day off next week. So why do you participate? You've been in our community for so long and we're going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> Why do you participate in our jewelry brand makeover boot camp every year? Like all of them, you're always at them if you can be. Because there is always something to learn. There's always something that you present that might have a little different take to it. I also think that there's that mental thing of repetition. The yes. more you repeat something, the more I take notes of something, it may finally get into my head. Yep. Um, I love that. And I don't want I mean, to, it miss makes anything. me so happy to see like people who've already graduated from laying the foundation for many years, longtime members of our community. They come back every single time, especially for this boot camp, because it is that good. And I'm excited for this year because we're going to be updating some of the content and incorporating some AI strategies and changing them things up a little bit, which I think is always fresh and fun. So I'm excited about it. It's gonna be so amazing. it's worth it. For, so it's worth it for me to take the week off from it work is. and to to yep. be available. Yeah, we're gonna be. We'll have the uh, first training up probably in about a week. We're doing like a little bit of pre homework <laughs> and then moving forward. So we're excited about it. So it's funny. You sent me a message the other day, and you're like, you know, the first time I heard about Flourish and Thrive, I wasn't really sure about it, and then you eventually came to join. So I hope it's not too bad of a story, but I want to hear a little bit about it is how you came into learning about the Flourish and Thrive Academy and our community and all those things? Um, in 2015, prior to um, the Wendy Rosen trade show, yes. moving to Washington, to the Washington Convention Center, um, I had been at a training that uh, Wendy Rosen did on uh, basically jewelry business. Mm -hmm. um, and she knew that I was both a member of the Women's Jewelry Association and she was a member of our chapter and the uh, Washington Guild of Goldsmiths. And I'm a past president of the Washington Guild of Goldsmiths. And she offered to give us a the guild a booth if we wanted to take a booth. Oh, cool. But the condition, the condition was she would give us one if we would pay for one. So it would be a double uh, booth. Like a two for one. Uh, to write a two for one exactly and she offered it to me and the two women who were in a, a guild members who were attending that same class unbeknownst to me they were in one of your very very first mm -hmm. flourish and thrive uh ltf mm -hmm. classes mm -hmm. and we started talking and we got one other person to join us and i think the thing that I found, and I may have been a little bit snobbish about it, some of the things that they were saying, they really didn't know anything about shows yeah. and how to approach a show. Mm. So I'm saying, no, you really do need lights. You can't go into the convention yeah. center without your own overhead track right. lighting. You need, you know, and I went through kind of a list of things to do um, that we had to do. I mean, I think we made a pretty good um, showing for, I was the mm -hmm. only one that had ever done a craft show. I had never done a trade show. Yeah. That's why we started and, mastering wholesale all those years ago to kind of yeah. really dig, dig deep into setting up for a trade show, an in-person show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so that was, that was it. I think that uh, they probably had some of the you know early ideas that you were teaching. I was, maybe I wasn't buying into some of what they were saying. I've actually learned to price differently since taking, laying the foundation and in fact have increased how I priced, you know, how I price things. And I will tell you that, you know, why do I stay around? Because the Diamond Insiders yeah. has well, been a godsend, godsend to me, um, the support that I've gotten within the community Everything from getting a commission and not knowing how to price it and throwing it out there and having two of the, at that time, two of the coaches who had higher end businesses 
respond to me about how to price that particular mm. piece because it was more of a one-off. Yes. It was not going to be an, it was not going to go into my studio. It was ne never going to go on to an eventual website. It was never going to go into a gallery because gallery price, it wouldn't have made it. Yes. Uh, plus I was trying to do this piece on a budget that the gentleman had. Mm -hmm. And of course there was no way in hell I was going to be able to do it at his budget yes. when he wanted it, when he wanted a natural blue sapphire. Yeah. <laughs> So it was try to figure out what the price was. And I did that with Nicole and Sarah's help at the time. Go back to the client and sell them on com coming up with more money. Yeah. Which he and did. learning how to communicate the value of yeah. what he wants, right? That's, exactly. that's one of the huge things. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this up because you know that I do custom work too. And one of my exactly. favorite things, one of the things that I've spoken about is like a lot of times people come into a budget and they're just not educated. They don't know really what things cost. And so it's your job as a maker to be able to, or a designer or whatever you call yourself, a business owner, mm -hmm. to be able to educate the consumer on the other end and give them options. So if you wanna, if what's more important, staying in the budget or is it having the end result that you want? Because for right. some people it might be different. So you can say, okay, for your budget, here's what I can do for the end result. Here is the cost or the- Exactly, cost exactly. Here. And the other mm -hmm. thing, I, I truly believe that I sell and I realized that I coined this when you filmed me for my maker video. Yep. Is I want to be my client's jewelry fairy godmother. Yes. I want to be able to fulfill what it is that they want. And mm -hmm. I will jump through hoops, including this, particular gentleman found me online still he still can't even tell me how he found the the picture but he lived in Alaska and he didn't give me a lot of time you know typical man yeah he contacted it's... me two weeks <laughs> two weeks before his anniversary for a custom pendant that had to be fabricated and I had to get it to him thankfully he was willing to you know pay for FedEx yeah and I told him I wasn't sure at first whether I could get it done for his anniversary. But if I didn't, I would write everything out in a personalized card, you know, the whole bit, send that along so he could present it to his wife. I pushed, I got it done. I contacted him and he said, oh, we're actually going away for the weekend. Oh, I'd love to have it. Oh, geez. So I could take it with me. And I went, okay, will you do, over will you do overnight FedEx? To Alaska and he said yes so I put everything together packed it up drove down to FedEx and he had it in his hand so that he could take it away prior to their Valentine's Day anniversary I love that that's incredible I, I love that story so, I love hearing stories about uh, about these things now why don't we back to you know you mentioned earlier that you know your first experience encountering us you know, you were a little bit unsure because you felt like these people didn't know what they were doing a little bit. <laughs> I know that's kind of the gist I'm getting of it. <laughs> Go I ahead. I think it's you. I now know, I think, you know, they just didn't know how to approach this type of a show. Yeah, that's all. Exactly. But that, I mean, I can't, you know, it's like, we can teach everyone everything. We can't teach them exactly. how to execute it. That's their responsibility. <laughs> so, but it's fun because you learned about us, but then maybe a year went by or so, and then you came to it back to us again in one of the boot camps. So tell us a little bit about yes. your journey with Flourish and Thrive, because mm -hmm. you've taken several of our programs at this yeah. point. The way to really get into it is because one of the things you would ask me on our pre, you know, pre-call was how I sort of came to going back to, you know, jewelry after being an audiologist. Mm -hmm. I had been working and having the studio in the torpedo factory, but as my parents aged, mm -hmm. I became, because I have the medical aptitude, I became medical manager. Mm. And in 2005, my father suffered a head injury. Oh, geez. Um, I'm sorry yeah. about that. Uh, when they, yeah, thank you. When they were living in California and uh, we got him back to the DC area and I really was very much involved with his care until God bless him. He made an amazing recovery in that in 2005, he had a head injury and for his 93rd birthday, we bought him a new computer and he was trading stocks <laughs> on, 
on the computer wow. at 93. <laughs> I love it. So his brain, his brain came back to him. But after him, after he passed away in 2007, I wound up medical managing my mother until she died in 2016. Oh, and it was in 2016 that I found you all. I don't even know where I saw um, the uh, announcement for the boot camp, but basically I lost a full-time job. I was no longer medical manager. Mm -hmm. I was no longer caring for parents. My kids were flown, you yep. know, flew the cube. Um, <laughs> look, by that time, all of them were married and had kids. Yep. So it was time for me to develop an an identity of my own. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been daughter, wife, mother, grandmother, everything for everybody else. But this business, if I could make it a business, was mine. And that's what Flourish and Thrive and laying the foundation and especially the Diamond Insiders has given me. And so I, you had a, an August boot camp. It was for ramp up your holiday sales. And that I think that was the one, or I got ramp and I got another, the, uh, the, uh, bonus was another class supercharge, I think. Yeah. And that was it. That was when I started with the diamond insiders. Yeah. And I, I stayed knew. with it. Yes. And I did it monthly for several years until I realized this is ridiculous. There's got to be a yearly price that I can actually save a few dollars because you all taught me to look at what the bottom line yep. is and how much money I'm spending. And as soon as um, support said, well, of course you can do a year. I figured that's a, that's a necklace. I can do exactly. that. And it is worth it to me to be part of the Diamond Insiders. Even if I am not in that Facebook group every day reading, because believe me, I'm at the point, I don't want to read all of the yeah. stuff of the absolute newbies in it, but it's worth it for me to go to some of the special calls. Actually, I went to the most of the LTF calls if I yeah. was available, because there are still new things that you have included. People have different, you know, they ask different questions. You get different answers. There is always something I can learn. Yes. And we're, so for people who are listening, who are wondering what the Diamond Insiders is, it's our ongoing paid community for Flourish and Thrive, where we support people ongoing and help them execute the principles of the desired brand effect and everything that we teach in our programs. We do have other higher level programs like Momentum, and we're going to be releasing a, a new extension of that this year, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. But this is, it's a great community for people who just want to be in connection with people because one of the things that you told me as we were chatting is that you've developed these lifelong friendships. So let's talk about that. I can't wait. Well, when we started LTF, we, it was suggested that we find an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. And my first accountability partner reached out to me. Her name is Sarah Muse. She's from uh, Roanoke. And she said to me, and I was kind of floored. She said, I know you because I was Robert Smith's apprentice for years and Robert knows you and Robert talked about you. And I'm like, Robert talked about me. You know, <laughs> it's like you, you never expect that somebody is yes. talking about you, your jewelry, small anything, world. small world. So I of course said, sure, let's, let's be accountability partners. And at that time we had two other people who were, were part of our little group. Uh, but both of them have sort of fallen away. And then as, uh, in 2019, a group of us who had met at the uh, live event that Flourish and Thrive had put on in, I guess it was- Is in New York City. Think. Yeah. In yeah, oh, no, definitely New York. I'm trying to remember if it was the 2018 or the 2019 one, because I went to both of them. It may have been um, the one I think we went to, we had 2017 and 2018. We skipped 2019 because I was planning on bringing it back in 2020. And then the okay. world closed down. Well, yeah. then, then whatever it was, I was at two of them. So it was 2018 then. Um, met a group of people there. Um, immediate bonding. Mm -hmm. um, Vivian Sade. Um, yes. I, Irene Wu. Um, I'm going to suddenly forget. Um Christine Lupo, Candice um, Stribling, Stribling. Yep. Um, all the OGs, 
Lisa, Lisa, Lisa Robertson, all of these people, we all got together and um, Sarah, as I said, has this home on a mountain in Roanoke and we decided to do a retreat down there. And I got a, almost forgot Dawn. And during that retreat, Dawn DeJesery, who is a major coach for Flourish and Thrive. Yeah, she's now, a, one of our Laying the Foundation coaches and she runs the Diamond Insiders. Yes. Right. Asked to be an accountability partner with Sarah and me. And we were like, absolutely. Yep. And that has grown into an amazing friendship. We said, because everybody's gotten busier during the, you know, the years, Dawn is doing so much coaching. Uh, Sarah's bespoke business has taken off in a different direction. We basically uh, meet every other Friday. That's great. Assuming somebody can show up. Uh, but in between time, Dawn and I will will call each that, other if Dawn has a question Every other Friday for is me. incredible. That's a huge commitment. Like for that long of a time, that's 8 incredible. 8 a.m. in the morning. It's really, <laughs> oh God, it's really a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> there's some days it's really hard to get up for that I bet. Lab, uh, call. Uh, but I think Dawn and I have really developed a, I mean, both all of us have, but Dawn and I have got, a, have developed a very tight relationship and we do bounce things back and forth. Uh, in addition to what we bounce back and forth for our accountability calls. Um, I love that. So, yeah. So you so, joined, uh, you joined the community back 2016. You've been, you've developed all these friendships. Now we were talking a little bit in our pre-interview about how your business has grown because you have seen some amazing growth, but then also some fluctuations because the world yes. is a different place these days. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, actually um, the first jump that I found from the time I joined Flourish and Thrive 2016 to 2017, um, my sales over doubled. Actually, it was wow. more than double. Um, and I had, I maintained that level or pretty close to that level for the three years through 2019 mm -hmm. when, you know, things hit the skids in 2020. So did my business. Well, your torpedo uh, factory was closed. So you couldn't even make we sales were, really. Right. Yeah. We were right. We were closed through June, but the city allowed us, any of us who needed a hardship could extend, you know, um, and all three of us were high risk mm -hmm. and there were no vaccines. Um, two of us, cancer survivors, one whose husband was terminal cancer. So none of us were going into the studio yeah. and we really didn't go back into the studio. I reopened it um, for October, November, and December. Mm -hmm. So the fact that my sales dropped by half yeah, I wasn't pretty, open very much. So if yeah. I did half of it in three months or four months, that was pretty darn good. That's great. And then 2021 was the best year I have had in over 30 years of business. Uh, it was mind boggling. I never thought that as a small business, the level of small business that mine is, that I would even hit that number. Right, 2022 of course, went back down, not as bad as 2020, because 2022 people were traveling again. Yeah. And they weren't racing to buy jewelry. Also, it had been drummed into my head by my accountability partners. You have got to raise your prices. They're, you're one of a kind pieces are too low. Once I started raising the prices so that the one of a kind pieces are over $1,000, I've dropped the people who are walking into the torpedo factory who are going to buy them. Because remember, we we still get a, we get plenty of locals, but we still are a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. And not that many tourists come into a building thinking they're going to drop a thousand fifteen hundred dollars. But they're not that kind of but they do, but it's few and far between. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm trying to get more. I'm trying to cultivate more of them. Mm -hmm. But in a building that a lot of people come in in their jeans and grubbies and are looking for twenty dollar earrings, mm -hmm. I'm not the person they're going to buy from. Yeah. No, that's all. Mm -hmm. I'm not that. That's 
not who they're going to buy from. But the um, level of detail in your work is not, that's not your customer. So it doesn't really, yeah. Absolutely. And I can usually tell when somebody comes in, mm -hmm. but I know, but I know not to do that because I remember my own mother who was always a very played down person. And yeah. people might make an assumption that was an incorrect assumption about her. Let me tell you a story so, real quick. I was uh, shopping in Rome and we were running out. It was a really hot day and I was just wearing my like workout clothes. And I walked into this shoe store, had a bunch of shoes that I wanted to try on. The guy ignored me for an older lady who was dressed nicely. I was so irritated that he wouldn't ask me for <laughs> to pull the shoes. I left and ended up buying two very expensive handbags at the store next door because they were so nice, like, and actually mm -hmm. talk to me. So that's a really great motto because you just never know. <laughs> Pretty Woman, to remember the movie? Yep. yep. <laughs> that's what it is. I recently had that uh, experience. I had somebody come in. I mean, she was dressed weekend, you know, played day, totally played down, the puffy coat, the jeans, the hair sort of not, the way she mm. probably wears it every day to work. And she happened to walk over to the case and pointed, she said something. She's like, oh, well, I've, I've, I bought these earrings before, you know, for a gift before. So I got, got up from the bench, I went over, I talked to her. Turned out she purchased the earrings for, um, I guess, it, I'm not sure if it was her actual maid of honor or one of her bridesmaids for being in her wedding. Mm -hmm. And now turn around, this gal was getting married and she says, I want the necklace. I wow. want to buy a necklace that'll go with the earrings. And um, it's a good thing. I keep really good records on my iPhone. This is my customer management yeah. system. I use notes in my iPhone mm -hmm. and I looked her up and I found her and she was looking at white pearls. And I looked down and I go, you bought the pink pearls. Wow. And she went, oh, my God, can you make me a pink pearl necklace? And I looked, thank the good Lord, I had one blank finished because she needed it instantly. Mm -hmm. She was leaving for London. And I said, give me 20 minutes, go out for coffee, and I'll have the necklace ready for you when you come wow. back. That's incredible. So I had it. And I checked on, you know, I I do my due diligence of whose work it is. What would you say to someone who is considering joining Laying the Foundation and our community? It is a fabulous community. Lots of information to help you structure your business, uh, improve your business, how to teaches you how to look at your jewelry and come up with a cohesive collection. It does tell you, I mean, it does teach you about websites, about all of the things that you need to be successful. But I think one of the biggest selling points is still the community. Yes. It's the, the community. I, the relationships in the community. Most Being a jeweler is solitary. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have anybody to run something by, you can be making the same mistake over and over and over again. When you have a community of people, you can throw something out. And you've got coaches like we have in this community. Somebody can either set you straight or tell you, yeah, you really are on the right track. And one thing that I wrote down that I do want to make sure I say is one of the biggest things that I have received from this community is validation about my work. Tracy, you and Robin were always supportive of the work that I did. You saw in the work and complimented me on the work that I did. You saw value Beautiful. in the, the work that I did. Thank you. And my self-esteem has risen considerably because of this community. I guess I've always been, you know, I'm the the uh, uh, more insecure than I probably should with the quality of the work that I do. <laughs> I now believe that I deserve the prices that I'm putting on my pieces. I also believe if you don't buy it, that's fine. Somebody else is going to come along and buy it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to discount it and give my work away. 
because each one of those pieces has a piece of me in it. Yes. It's and true. I don't want to give that away. And I have learned that through Flourish and Thrive, from having taken your programs, from being in the Diamond Insiders community, um, definitely from my accountability partners hitting me over the head. Um, I'm able to tell stories about my work in a way I didn't before. I hear myself talking the way I'm animated, the way I present myself in the studio is completely different than how I did in 2002 when I first wow. walked into that studio. And I'm actually an introvert, but when I'm there talking about the jewelry, I sound extroverted. Yeah, that's so good. You know? Yep. And uh, I really think that's, you know, a lot. Um, one other thing I want to pop in, if I can go back to, put it wherever you want it. Um, we were talking about my being a, a, a breast cancer survivor. And part of that being a breast cancer survivor is I have been very active with the Duke Cancer Institute since they saved my life. And I do believe they saved my life mm -hmm. with the clinical trial that I joined. Um, I've been on a advisory board at the Cancer Institute since 2008. And in the last couple of years, I guess it's been three years, I decided that in the month of October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I was going to run a pink pearl promotion or fundraiser for the Duke Cancer Institute. So 20% of every pink pearl or pink pearl jewelry and 10% of whites and Tahitians is donated to the Duke Cancer Institute for Breast Cancer Research. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. Well, I thank you. I mean, I learned a lot of that from you asked us about what are your core values? Mm -hmm. What are your core values? Besides my core value of lifelong learning, philanthropy is a big one Yeah, for a core value. That's amazing. And this is my way of giving back. Um, it's the same thing in the studio. If somebody asks me how you did something, I share that. It's not a secret. I'm happy to, to pass that along because other people passed it along to me mm -hmm. and I want to pass it along to them. Incredible. Now, where can everyone find you, Estelle, if they want to check out your beautiful uh, jewelry? Please. Um, my website is estellevernon.com. That's E-S-T-E-L-L-E-V-E-R-N-O-N.com. And on Instagram and Facebook, it's at Estelle Vernon Designs. Amazing. Thanks for being here, Estelle. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Thrive by Design. I hope that you are inspired by Estelle's story. And if you'd like to learn more about our Laying the Foundation program and the Diamond Insiders, head on over to flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash LTF. This program will change the game for you and give you the solid foundation that your business needs to thrive as a jewelry artist. Ciao for now.